Good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of the City Grand Master and the officers and brethren of the City of London Derry Grand Orange Lodge, can I bid you a warm welcome to this, our annual Boyne anniversary service. In a year which has created many strange circumstances for everyone, this online production is a first for City Grand. We ought, of course, to be together this afternoon in Kilfennan Presbyterian Church. I am actually recording this opening part of the service in Brookvale Presbyterian Church, just outside Rathfryland in County Down, on what has been a very hot and sunny as summer day. We ought to be together, however, in Kilfennan. In reality, we are instead together at home. We trust, however, there will be no less a sense of unity as we worship the Lord in this pre-twelfth service. My personal recollection of the annual Boyne service goes back to 1961, when, as a member of Junior LOL number 57, I took part in the service uh, for the first time. The tradition of our city grand, and indeed of many lodges and district and county lodges uh, throughout the jurisdiction, has been to meet for worship and give thanks to God for deliverance at the Boyne on the Sunday prior to the 12th of July. We felt it important in City Grand that this tradition should not lapse in 2020, despite all of the difficulties created by coronavirus. And so rather than being seated row by row in church, this service is coming to you. Can I welcome all of the brethren and the sisters and the juniors and family and friends, wherever or whenever you will pick up on this service. I'm delighted to have two of my fellow chaplains, Brother the Reverend uh, Chris Pierce and Mervyn Lindsay, taking part in the service. You will hear from both of them later on as we move through uh, the service. We will also include an act of remembrance. It was always part of our prayer on our way to church that we would pause at the war memorial in, in the diamond. We felt it important that that also ought to be observed today. We continue to be deeply indebted to those who served and sacrificed in world wars and also in other conflicts. And so we will pause to remember, lest we forget. Can I read some words of Jesus in John chapter 8? If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. We turn to God today and to the truth of God's word. We turn to him as we read, as we preach, as we sing, as we pray, as we remember in his presence. The desire of City Gran is that we would know a sense of God with us, and also a desire within our own heart to worship and to follow him in faith. Let's pause for a moment of prayer as we begin our service today. Let's pray. O oh God, our loving Father in heaven, we might be gathering separately today, but together we are in spirit. We draw aside, Lord, to worship you, to glorify your holy name. We worship our living Saviour. We come to honour Christ. We rejoice that as we are gathered, so Jesus is here with us. Help us, Lord, we ask, to realise the presence of God in our own setting and unite us in the Lord, we pray. Amen. Our opening praise this afternoon is that well-known and well-loved hymn that we often use at orange services and indeed at services of remembrance. 
O God, our help in ages past. Please feel free to sing along as you watch today. We praise God together. thank God that we are able to praise him. Let's all bow together before God in prayer. Let us all pray. Heavenly Father, as we gather together this afternoon, we might be separated, but there is a togetherness, and we thank you for that. And we come, Lord God, with a real sense of joy and gladness in our hearts. We come admiring the beauty of your presence that fills our lives. We are here, Father, as your people to worship you, to meet with you. We rejoice that the glory of the living God rests and abides with us. We are children of dust, and yet, Father, we can meet and speak with you in this special way. Whenever we consider your deeds in eternity, whenever we see what you have wrought in and since creation, whenever we realize the awesome power that you possess and the control that you have over our lives, as we understand the strength and the extent of your saving love, Father, we can do no other except join in the privilege of worship to bring you the thanks and the adoration of our lives. And so we come today, Lord, to worship you at home. We come to worship with our hearts overflowing, overflowing with a longing and a desire to enjoy this time 
we spend together. To rejoice in the presence of the Lord and to allow you to speak to us through your living word. We acknowledge, Father, your word is never idle. Your word is forever challenging us, encouraging us, rebuking us, convicting us, and all in the power of your Holy Spirit. And so we praise you today for the fullness of the word, for the message of mercy and grace and love that it brings. And we praise you also that your word tells us of Jesus as we acknowledge all that he has done for us. And yet we know, Father, there is nothing more important or amazing than the work that Christ has done for us on the cross of Calvary, that the salvation he has won is ours through faith in him. His sacrifice of love, standing indeed at the very summit of our existence and our emotions, the ultimate event in salvation history, planned from eternity and planted into the lives of people like us through faith and trust in Jesus. We thank you, Father, that you have been with us in the, this difficult year of coronavirus. We realise, Lord, that many have been ill through the virus. We thank you for those who have recovered. Sadly, many, many have died. And so we pray today for every family which has been affected by this pandemic. And yet through our time of isolation, Lord, there has been other illness. There have been deaths. There have been people, maybe even ourselves, who have struggled. And how we have needed the presence of God and the hand of God's blessing and protection upon us. So we thank you, Father, for every goodness and every blessing we have enjoyed in this year of pandemic. We would pray today, Lord, for the Orange Institution. We pray for our Grand Master, Edward. We pray for the Grand Orange Lodge of Ireland, for each county, private, and district lodge within its jurisdiction. We pray for those who are part of the ladies' lodges. We pray for our junior lodges. We pray, Father, for those who are involved in, in bands, across our own um, city lodge, city grand lodge, but also uh, across our province. We thank you, Lord, for the part that the institution plays in everyday life. We have been so delighted, Lord, to see how our brethren have stepped up to the mark and provided so many items of uh, PPE and food and help and assistance to those who were in great need over recent months. And Lord, we thank you that our brethren have been to the fore in helping each other through those days. So Lord, our institution has not been found wanting and we thank you for that. We pray for each lodge and each of our brethren within the jurisdiction of the City Grand Lodge. We pray for our City Grand Master, Brother Aiken, and for his deputy brother Hunter and for the officer team in Grand Lodge. We thank you, Father, for the work that they do. We pray for your hand upon them. And above all, we seek your guidance for them as they lead us in the days to come. Father, this will be a different 12th of July. It will be a 12th at home. And yet, Lord, there should be no less a sense of thanksgiving and celebration as we share in the 12th of July. We thank you for what it means to us. We thank you for how it is a demonstration of our faith and our culture. It shows the world that we are thankful for the past, but we are a people who live in the present and also through our faith in Jesus, a people who have a hope for the future. And we ask indeed, Lord God, that all of this might be reflected in whatever way we celebrate the 12th of July in 2020. 
And then we pray for Her Gracious Majesty, Queen Elizabeth II, and the royal family. We thank you for the example Her Majesty has set to us over the years of her reign. We thank you, Lord, for her dedication to duty from a young girl when she was crowned as Queen of the Realm. We thank you, Lord God, indeed, for how she has upheld even her own family. And we thank you for the hand of God upon them through very difficult days. Be with our Queen, we pray. Long may she reign over us and long may we continue to remember her and to pray for her. Father, it's always good to share in prayer before God and so we bring our prayers to you today in the name of Jesus, our Lord and our Saviour. Amen. I'm going to hand over now to my good friend and brother, the Reverend Chris Pierce. Uh, Deputy Grand Chaplain of Ireland and Chaplain of Rafoe No. 3 District, Loyal Orange Lodge. Chris will bring us a reading from the Holy Scriptures. Our lesson from the Bible this day is from the 8th chapter of the Gospel of John, beginning at verse 31. Then Jesus said to those Jews which believed on him, If you continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And they answered him, We be Abraham's seed, and were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? And Jesus answered them, saying, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. And the servant abideth not in the house for ever, but the son abideth ever. If the son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. I know that you are Abraham's seed, but ye seek to kill me, because my word hath no place in you. I speak that which I have seen with my father, and you do that which ye have seen with your father. They answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. Jesus saith unto them, If you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. But now ye seek to kill me, a man that hath told you the truth, which I have heard of God, and this did not Abraham. Ye do the deeds of your father. Then said they to him, We be born not of fornication, we have but one father, even God. Jesus said unto them, If God were your father, you would love me. For I proceedeth forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Here ends the lesson. We now pause in our service for an act of remembrance at the Diamond in Londonderry. Following this, Brother Reverend Mervyn Lindsay, who is the Deputy Grand Chaplain of Ireland and Deputy City Grand Chaplain, will bring a message from God's Word and lead us through the conclusion of our worship.
Good afternoon, brethren, sisters, friends. It's a joy for me to be part of this service today and to be able to share with you from God's precious word. The passage that I want to speak particularly from is John chapter 8, read for us just earlier by Brother Chris, and also to touch on 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17. The title of my sermon today is, What Makes Us Free? What Makes Us Free? We are blessed to live in the free world. And over the years, we've had many enemies who would have denied us our freedoms, whether James and his armies, or the Roman Church, or Nazi Germany, or whoever. But of course, in these present days, It is COVID-19 that has stolen many of our freedoms from us, at least for a time. Freedom to go to work for many of us, although we may be returning now. Freedom to socialize. Freedom to hold our annual parades. And it has done something that I believe we never dreamed would happen. It has stolen from us, if only temporarily, the assembling of ourselves together for public worship. And so we hold our service online today. And I address you not from the pulpit of Kilfenan Presbyterian Church as was originally envisaged, uh, but from my own pulpit in Sandhills Presbyterian Church. But remember, folks, the church has not been shut down. Only our buildings And by the grace of God, they will soon be open again too. But freedom, some of our freedoms have been denied us for various reasons. Freedom is one of our greatest privileges. Political freedom and personal freedom. The freedom that allows us to democratically elect our government. The freedom that allows us to go about our daily business. The freedom also that allows us to worship and to serve our God openly and unhindered. And in large measure, we enjoy our freedoms because of the victory of King William at the Boyne and the sacrifices of the psalm and other conflicts over the year. We were pleased to be able to mark the the 75th anniversary of VE Day on May the 8th, marking that victory over Nazi Germany. Freedom. Freedom. Everyone wants freedom of one kind or another. Whether it's freedom from political control and political restraints, such as you might find in places like China. Whether it's freedom from terror and murder, which we know so much about in our beloved province, and which we have seen Uh, on the streets of of Reading and Glasgow just in recent days, or whether it's freedom from biblical commands and moral requirements, to name but a few. Everyone wants freedom. But what is freedom? And what makes us free? What is true freedom? Well, I want to notice three things today in that regard. First of all, uh, from... John's Gospel, chapter 8, we discover that the Scriptures make us free. We discover that the Saviour makes us free. And from 2 Corinthians 3 and 17, we see that the Spirit makes us free. So, first of all, coming to John chapter 8, the Scriptures make us free. We're told here that truth shall make you free. This is a a well-known quote that many people don't even realize comes from the Bible. In fact, it's from the very lips of Jesus himself. And he said to those who were showing signs of believing in him, that they would be shown to be his true disciples if they obeyed his word. Verse 31 Then Jesus said to those who believed in him, If you abide in my word, ye are my disciples indeed. And verse 32, And you shall know the truth, and the truth 
shall make you free. Folks, God's word is truth. He tells us that in John 17, verse 17. Jesus prayed, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. The scriptures are the truth. They are the only truth. And if you want true freedom, then you must accept that truth and live by that truth. And if you would be true orange men and women, then you must abide in his truth. To abide in his truth brings freedom. That has been shown to be true both politically and geographically over the years. If you were to take out a map and look where the Bible has gone, if you were to look where the gospel message has gone, that beautiful good news message of the saving grace of God through Jesus Christ, you will find that it has brought freedom. Wherever the truth of God's word has gone, it has brought freedom. And it not only brings personal freedom from sin and from the penalty of sin, but it brings national freedom. It brings political freedom, generally speaking, as Christian people influence society and influence government. And we are blessed in our land with the political and religious freedoms that we enjoy. Though our religious freedoms are coming more and more under attack. <clears throat> but folks, brethren, it is as we turn our back on the scriptures that our freedoms will diminish. And in the United Kingdom, as I say, they are beginning to diminish. Things that we took for granted, uh, we can no longer take for granted. Street preachers, for example, are being harried on the streets of England. <clears throat> Our schools and public places are becoming cold houses to the word of God and to the truth that God's word is. And as orange men, we have a duty and a responsibility to accept God's truth and to live by God's word and to promote the truths of the Bible before others in society, in our homes, in our lodge meetings, wherever God leads us and takes us. We have a responsibility to hold on to the gospel freedoms that have been so hard won and to proclaim them and be witnesses to his truth. Oh, in years gone by, the invention of the printing press in, in the mid-1400s enabled the mass production of the scriptures. Then the Reformation, led by Luther, followed by Calvin, allowed for the spread of the word of God, that truth that sets people free. And those countries that embraced the word of God and embraced the God of the word. And that's perhaps the important thing, not just to read the word of God, but to embrace the God of the word as our God and Savior. And those countries that did that are those that, generally speaking, enjoy freedom. Places like Great Britain and the United States, amongst others. Wherever any nation follows the teaching of the Bible and bases its laws on biblical principles, that nation will enjoy freedom. And it is a great sad with a, it is with great sadness that we acknowledge today that our nation and our government is turning more and more away from the truth of the Word of God and biblical principles. We see that in the, the heinous abortion laws that have been foisted upon Northern Ireland. We see that in the no fault divorce laws that are being brought into England and Wales. Our own Prime Minister, in a sense, ha had a brush with death because of the coronavirus. And still, he hasn't wakened up. And our government continue to pursue a pathway that is contrary to the truth of God's word. And they will bring the nation more and more into bondage 
ways that they might never imagine. And so we need to be careful, folks, that we do not neglect nor abandon our biblical heritage, lest we lose our blessed freedoms. And again, I say, as orange men and women, we ought to be setting an example in regular church attendance and in accepting and holding to Christ's teaching. We need to take the Reformed faith seriously and not just pay lip service to it. Orange men should be those who not only attend church, but who are godly people and who are found to be in positions of leadership and authority within our churches, promoting the gospel of Christ and claiming those freedoms that we enjoy. And so we see, first of all, then in verse 32 of John chapter 8, that the truth sets us free. God's word sets us free. But secondly, we see that the Savior sets us free. Look at verse 36. Therefore, if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. If the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. Freedom flows from the written word, from, from God's word, and from the living word, from the scriptures and from the Lord Jesus Christ sets people free. Christ sets people free. Has he set you free, brother, sister, friend? Have you come to Christ, repented of your sin, and believed in him to forgive you, to wipe the slate clean, to bear all your sins away and give you that new beginning? Let's look at a couple of examples of people that Christ set free. Christ set Nicodemus free from religious bondage. And maybe some of us are found today in bondage to religion. Nicodemus was, earth, was earthbound. He was locked into trying to keep the law and perform the rites and the rituals of Judaism. It was all about what he must do. But Jesus opened up the world of the supernatural to him. Oh, that God would open up the world of the supernatural to us today, that his spirit would lock into us and open our eyes to see the truth that God has for us, the blessing that God had for us. Jesus opened up the world of the supernatural to Nicodemus. Jesus showed him the necessity of a new beginning, of a spiritual birth. That's why he said to him, you must be born again. To be born again and become a spiritual man would set Nicodemus free from bondage to the law. Free from slavishly trying to do the impossible. Because no human being can keep the law perfectly. And that's what's required. Perfection. But we will always fail. Even though we try our hardest. And I know many of you try hard. But every time we try and then feel it, the burden and the bondage becomes greater and more heavy and hard to bear. That is why we need grace. And God's grace was demonstrated in the giving of his son to perfectly keep the law and to die in our place. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God commended his love toward us in that while we were still sinners, without having to do anything for ourselves, while we were still sinners, while we had no strength to save ourselves, he gave his son to die for our sins. God's grace was demonstrated in the giving of his son. We need only trust and depend upon what he has done. Brethren, friends, it's not about attending church only, though that is good and I want to encourage that. As soon as our churches are opened again, I trust that you will all be found there Sunday after Sunday. But going to church on its own will not bring you freedom from sin and from its condemnation. Being a good person, being charitable, being a good neighbor, 
These things are all good and to be commended. But we will never have freedom from sin and from its penalty unless we accept the gracious gift of God to us in Jesus Christ, his Son. Christ set Nicodemus free from bondage to religion. Have you been set free from a slavish bondage to religion? Have you accepted Christ offered to you by God's grace? Christ set Zacchaeus free from the lust for money. That was his driving force. Perhaps for many of us today, where we are also too consumed with with the lust for money and the things and the pleasures of the world, that we do not give Christ a place in our lives. And we need to be set free from that lust for money, to trust in Christ. But we'll not dwell on that today, for we have a limited time. The other one that I want to think about is this. Christ set the woman at the well free from immorality. Remember Christ met her at the well when she came to draw water in the heat of the day. Perhaps this poor woman had been badly treated and let down by the men in her life. Divorced five times. She she perhaps had lost confidence in marriage. But Jesus knows that she is now in a relationship with a man to whom she is not married. And sad to say, folks, that seems to be the norm these days in which we live in. That people just get together without getting married. But you know what? The fact remains. The scriptures make it clear that any sexual relationship outside of marriage is a sin. And the scriptures also tell us that marriage is between a man and a woman. And you know, any arrangement, though it might be legal, between two men or two women, whatever it is, it's not marriage. And it's contrary to God's word. It's contrary to God's will. And it is a sin. And we have fallen into that state of moral decay where marriage and family has been set aside. Satan has had a field day and we need to turn back to the word of God. We need to be set free from bondage to sinful sexual immorality. Orange men in this regard too should live by God's standard and set an example to those around them. Yes, this woman was in bondage to sexual sin and Jesus set her free. He didn't condemn her, he set her free. He gave her a new life, a new hope, a new beginning when she put her faith and trust in him. As a nation, we are in bondage to sexual sin both heterosexual sin uh, and homosexual promiscuity and all the confusion and pain and hurt that flows from that. And we see it in our society day after day. We hear about it on our broadcast programs. And our nation is in a state of moral decline and moral decay. And we need to turn back to the word of God and we need to turn back to Christ our saviour, to be set free from such bondage. And spiritual freedom can be ours through faith in Christ. Yes, we thank God for the peace and the freedom that we enjoy because of the sacrifices of the boy and the psalm and throughout two world wars and so on. But the personal spiritual freedom, freedom from sin and its penalty, which is eternal death, That freedom is a gift from God that we all need. It is a gift that we need to embrace and we need to make it our own by coming and bowing the knee to Christ and saying, Lord Jesus, I am a sinner. I need your forgiveness. No one can help me but you. Lord Jesus, forgive me. Cleanse me of my sin. Make me your own. That's what we need to do. We need to receive it personally. 
and individually. That is a gift of God's grace that influences nations and from which political freedom grows and flows. Our nation will be changed and transformed. Our government will be transformed if more of us had this freedom that only Christ offers. And if we use the gospel freedoms that we have today to read God's word, to abide in God's word, to accept God's word, to accept the God of the word as our personal saviour, and to live the Christian life as we ought to do before men, it will have a tremendous impact. And the third thing that I want to mention more briefly, that the Spirit makes us free. Second Corinthians uh, chapter 2 and verses 16 and 17. Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. There is freedom. Man has long searched for God through religious ceremony and in various ways, but Paul says here that there's a veil over his heart that hides God from him, that he cannot see God or understand the scriptures and respond to them. Nevertheless, he said, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away, verse 16. And the Lord comes. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Brethren, friends, Christ came to free us from the law and to give us his Holy Spirit. It is God's Spirit that makes us alive to God and shows us our need convicts us in our heart of our sin and our need of forgiveness. It is God's spirit that gives us faith to believe. And that's my prayer as I, as I come to a close today, that God's spirit would work in our hearts to open God's word up to us, to make it come alive to us, to make it real to us, to penetrate our hearts, to convict us in our consciences and cause us to respond in submitting to God and giving our life to him and seeking his forgiveness. Folks, there is freedom in Christ Jesus. True freedom comes through the word of God, comes through the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, and applied to our hearts by his Spirit. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Does the Spirit dwell in your heart, brothers, sisters? friends. Oh, never abandon this truth, this wonderful reformation truth, that forgiveness and salvation is by faith, is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Apply to our hearts through the Spirit, through the Word of God alone, and for the glory of God alone. Political freedom makes us free citizens. It means we can go out and cast our vote. It means we can go about our daily work. It means we can gather for worship. But spiritual freedom makes us free saints. It frees us from sin, from its burden, from its penalty, from its guilt. And it gives us eternal life. How free are you today? Yes, political freedom you enjoy, I know that. But do you have spiritual freedom? Is Christ in your heart by his Spirit? Do you know that your sins are forgiven? Do you know that you have eternal life? And are you living for God before men? That's the challenge for us today. And now as we close, uh, we have our next hymn, the banner of the cross, verse 2, says, Though the foe may rage and gather as the flood, let the standard be displayed, and beneath its fold, 
as soldiers of the Lord, for the truth be not dismayed. Let's sing this great hymn. Now let us join together in prayer. Father, we thank you for the gospel freedoms that we enjoy. Help us never to take them for granted. Oh, we thank you for your word, the truth that sets us free. We thank you for the Savior, the living word, who shed his blood on the cross to set us free from sin and from hell. Oh God, by your spirit, work in the hearts and lives of all who hear this service to draw us under your royal banner. Grant us faith to repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of our sins and the salvation of our souls. Help us to abide in your word as we go forth to witness to the Christian faith as reclaimed at the Reformation and handed down by your faithful servants, our forefathers. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God our Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be upon us all this day and forevermore. Amen. And we close now with the National Anthem. <laughs>